And now we'll move on to the notice of motion um, and we'll start with a presentation um, of advice on the notice on, on the notice of motion. So um, Mary Richardson, and as I said at the beginning, uh, we do have uh, representatives from um, B6 Wattpack and uh, Christchurch NZ and uh, um, uh, Venues Autotahi here as well to support. Uh, and I'm going to, after the presentation, open it up to questions to all or any um, of those that have um, joined us. Tim's indicating. Yes, I, I was going to um, begin by um, just inviting Tim Scandrit just to say a couple of words at the beginning because at a previous um, discussion of this issue, he um, uh, identified a conflict of interest because he sits on the Venues Autotahi Board, but the Venues Autotahi Board is already determined as the operator. So if I could just hand over to you, Tim. Yeah, um, thank you. For those who don't know me, I'm Tim Scandrit. I'm the Councillor for Kashmir. And as Leanne had um, pointed out, and thank you, Leanne, for this opportunity, I had not taken part in any vote. I've been on the board of Otatahi, uh, Venues Otatahi since 2013, and it's been a real privilege to be part of that organisation and represent them. Um, when this first came up, we were given um, a directive from uh, this council table that the financial envelope was unmovable. So we were to come up with the best um, option available. So that is exactly what we did. Because with the arenas, the absolute crucial thing is its live um, experience for the, the attending public. And so that is what we did. And we've come up with the 25,000 with the best possible venue for that live experience. However, the, um, as Leanne pointed out, Venues Otatahi has been already chosen as the venue operator, so there is no conflict there. And as there seems to be a bit of movement to that unmovable envelope, I feel that I, I can make a, um, a decision today based on the fact that I am a Christchurch City Councillor with 35 years of, um, uh, in the business of large concerts separate to Venues Otatahi. So I do bring a lot of um, knowledge in this venue and in this um, area, and I do feel that it's important to make that decision today. And it's, um, I am obviously an independent, so it's, as Annabelle Turley said, it won't be um, political. So thank you. Thank, thank, thank you for that. And um, it, it was slightly further than I was yeah. kind of expecting you to be <laughs> said. Um, but, but, but it is extremely useful because I think it's important to be on the record uh, in terms of what is a change in, in um, designation for the purposes of voting. And you have taken additional advice and the advice is that you are able to make the call yourself yes. and the call that you've made is that you are not conflicted and you will participate in the debate today. Thank you. Thank you. So if I hand over to you, Mary. Um, Sorry, before Mary starts. Uh, and uh, thank you for giving us an opportunity. Wait, wait, wait. Oh. Um, look, I just want to uh, start off by just uh, introducing and acknowledging some people. So I first have to um, introduce uh, Greg, and, Greg and Gilbert um, from the B6 Wattpack team and actually also acknowledge them and the wider Kotoi team. The city and the council is incredibly lucky to have a team of this calibre uh, working on this project and we certainly couldn't have done any of the work that we have done to date without the massive input of uh, their team that both based here and in Australia. So Thanks. just Thanks, in Mary. incredible work, and um, we're lucky they're on board. I also want to acknowledge Barry Bragg, the new chair of uh, the um, uh, uh, company, along with Steve Windler and Richard Peebles, who are not here today, but are potentially li uh, listening in from live stream from Auckland. I uh, also want to acknowledge uh, Colin Main, Main's 
Bridge and also Grant Gerard from the Crusaders. Uh, they have been actively involved in the project and have provided significant input and advice all the way through, um, along with Tony Smale and other people from Sports Canterbury and other sports for sporting associations and event providers. Uh, plus also uh, Christchurch NZ, of course, will be speaking to this, and uh, you know, VBase and the rest of uh, Carolyn's team um, who have been across this all the way with uh, the wider council team. So I um, really want to acknowledge all their input. I also want to acknowledge um, you as councillors, um, so that on the 22nd of July, you came in to make the decision from your recess, and that was a big ask, um, that you don't get many recesses and you came in to make that decision. And then today, um, as we revisit this, uh, you know, you've had uh, to absorb a lot of information in a limited amount of time. Um, and uh, while we are able to present the cost and benefits of this uh, proposal alone, we are very mindful of the fact that you have a much bigger task because you have to weigh this up against the opportunity costs as well. So, you know, it's a big and hard decision and uh, I wouldn't like to be making it. So I want to acknowledge, um, you know, the work and the effort you're putting into uh, getting your heads around all this information. So thank you. Um, today in the, uh, what we intend to outline is just uh, clarify the current position and options, uh, provide some advice on the proposed uh, um, motions, uh, then walk through some of the construction cost estimates that are there. Um, we will also uh, hear from Christchurch NZ and uh, uh, venues or Tatahi around the operational and economic impact uh, and talk about the impact on rates and debt ratios and then just touch on the funding options that are covered in the notice of motion. Uh, as uh, the key message on the 22nd uh, and also in previous briefings and just reiterate again today, uh, it is really critical now that contractors and staff have some clear unequivocal design direction so we can move on to design as soon as possible. Uh, delays are costly uh, when we have escalation on a you know, um, build of this type. So actually to be able to move on is, is really critical. It wouldn't really be prudent to delay the program any longer, uh, particularly not in this post-COVID environment uh, with issues around escalation. Um, and, it, and it's also diverting staff and contractors' time away uh, from the project. So we really um, would appreciate a decision today that's uh, clear and so we can move forward. Uh, there's also the matter that you're well aware of, is that the uncertainty and controversy uh, is impacting on costs, as I've mentioned, but it's also impacting on public confidence and may impact on our ability to raise uh, external and third party funding. So again, uh, we would really appreciate our decision today. Uh, so in terms of background, um, and this is just touching for the uh, um, just to remind people of uh, why we, how we got here, um, and is that uh, just after the LTP was struck by council in late June, uh, council was notified but that there was a significant increase in the contractor's design and construction est price estimate. Um, also alongside that, the base case scheme had a number of unresolved issues and they were going to impact on OPEX. And in, and in many ways, the impact on OPEX was going to be more significant than the impact on CAPEX, because it's that OPEX that has a significant um, uh, rate impact. So, um, so some rapid work. Council uh, established a response team of uh, venues Otatahi and council and staff from across council to uh, look at options. At that stage, the indication we had from council was to try and bring that in budget or get as close to budget as possible. So that's what we worked on and presented in a series of briefings to councillors. Uh, there were two options that were put forward by the response team. The RT1, which is, uh, in case people sort of don't understand that terminology, that was shorthand for response team option one, uh, which was a 25 seat stadium with a U-shaped concourse and a stage pocket. That uh, option required a change of scope. It was, uh, it was the same budget <coughs> estimate in terms of overall budget, uh, but it required a scope change from 
uh, 25 past 5 down to 25. The other option was an RT2 <coughs> option, which did have the 30,000 seats, but it had no concourse, uh, and it did, again, locate the stage pocket. Uh, it was slightly over budget, uh, but it was not the preferred option because of user experience. Um, it just, and uh, the response team did not recommend that one uh, as, uh, and recommended the RT1 instead. At that stage, we didn't have any requests for alternative over budget options in any of the briefings uh, at all, so um, that, was, that was what we presented to Council on the 22nd. Uh, we certainly could have, if we had uh, the one that's done, uh, put forward in the notice of motion, we could have had that ready for July um, the 22nd, but we are where we are and we've got it now. Um, just also, just want to, um, uh, I guess, correct something because there's been a lot of misunderstanding in the public and the media about whether the financials were correct on the day of the 22nd of July. Um, so we just want to assure you that the financial information provided to Council on the 22nd of July was correct um, and it was uh, in PX, um, as you know. The uh, max, uh, you, you, uh, council were briefed that the uh, response team had moved money from the overall budget, different components of the overall budget, into the construction contract to try and maximise the outcome. So that was walked through line by line to councillors at briefings that actually the movement was about uh, things were moved out of the uh, project team, governance costs and other costings such as uh, rating and land, land costings and uh, <coughs> were put into, so the more money could go into constructions. Uh, councillors were fully briefed about those changes um, and as I said, went through line by line and those changes were supplied to, uh, via email to um, a number of them who asked for that. Uh, it was also those differences between the comparative uh, budgets were noted in a resolution that you passed. So um, just wanted to assure particularly the public and the media that have, have had a different opinion that actually uh, the information was correct, nothing was hidden from Councillor. I do just want to touch because it's, um, it's, it's all the language and all the terminology is very confusing um, in terms of the different concept designs. Just want to actually retouch on the concept designs that uh, we have um, been through and I won't go into the detail of that but we did have an investment case concept that had 25 seats um, and uh, uh, roof of course. Uh, permanent in situ, uh, in situ turf, uh, but had no level one concourse. So the investment case, 25,000 seats, no level one concourse. But we then had uh, the funding agreement with the Crown that identified uh, a, a roof, a minimum of 22,500 um, permanent seating capacity and uh, issues around uh, multi-use and capable of uh, hosting a number of activities. Uh, there was then the base case scheme, which was the one that was presented uh, to Council in late June, uh, which had, as I mentioned before, significant, um, it had 30,000 seats and it had a concourse, um, level one concourse, but uh, it was uh, over budget um, of, uh, at that stage, 131 million, and it had unresolved issues related to turf and concert mode, which would have actually impacted on operational costs. Uh, that base case was value managed to see how far it could be brought back down into budget, but it still left the 88 million over budget. And it had, uh, as we traversed on the 22nd, uh, large operational issues and, and budget issues. So uh, then there were the two options that were put forward by the response team, which I've touched on. The response team RT1, and I've said what that was, 25 uh, seats um, in a, in a U-shaped concourse. And the other one of RT2, the one that we didn't um, recommend, was the 30,000 seats but without a concourse. So those were the options that uh, have been traversed and debated uh, across council up, up until uh, this notice of motion. Um, 
uh, are, as, as everyone knows, um, that it was the option RT1 which was agreed on the 22nd of July um, with a desire to see if we could uh, explore increasing the seating capacity up to 27,500. Um, and it is, I do just want to note now, and we'll probably continue to note as we move through budgets, is these budgets are only high level estimates at this stage. Um, the, you know, the previous schemes had budgets that were down to sort of uh, minor sort of digits. Uh, the reality is, we are just at a concept design stage. A and as we've said, we will get more certainty as we move through the next months, or as the team move through the next months uh, of price. And it, but it won't be until April, May, when uh, we're presented with the DNC contract that we will have price certainty. At that stage, um, there will a, a contract, if it's signed, will be signed and then all the risk about escalation lands on this team here. Um, so uh, the, the, these are just estimates. Um, and it's, there's a high level of uncertainty around costs in this post-COVID environment. And we have um, reiterated that again, and it's presented in the report um, about the escalation risks that are, uh, you know, I think um, nobody is certain about at the moment. Um, but, it, but it seems to, at the moment, be tracking up and we don't know when it will track down. Uh, that's just a touch on on, on a uh, sketch of what the um, RT1 uh, looked like, so you can see where that pocket is in the, in the field um, in a circular concourse. Uh, so now if we move on to the notice of motion and our advice around the notice of motion, uh, we want to just touch first on uh, the motion two because it's the easiest one and it doesn't have all the detail behind it. So that is the motion to that uh, foreshadowed motion that um, the, if, to run a parallel preliminary design process. Uh, our, our advice is uh, definitive about this, unlike um, uh, when we get on to the actual uh, si size, is that actually this, we don't believe this would be a good idea at all. It will increase the costs, it will potentially delay the delivery of the project, and it will add complexity and risk to the project. Uh, that uh, uh, very quick diagram up there is trying to give you a snapshot and a picture of the process. Um, as you know, we are in a pre-contract service agreement with uh, Kortui or B6 Wattpack at the moment, uh, and then in May, as I said, we move into a DNC contract. This pre-service contract agreement has three components. It has the co concept design, which is where we're at now. We then move into preliminary design, and then the team move into develop design and quotations. So a three-stage process. So a rough order magnitude sort of, or an estimate uh, provided by the QS. Um, it's an independent QS that, who did uh, um, liaise with B6 Wattpack. But that independent QS has identified that to continue a parallel process of that, when we say parallel process, that's two designs, the 25,000 and the 30,000. Uh, if it, that went through to end of preliminary design, that would be seven to nine million and there still potentially wouldn't be certainty of price. If it was continued through to develop design and to prepared full quotation, that could be in the magnitude of 18 to 22 million. Um, if B6 Wattpack were not able to scale resources to run two in parallel, they would have to actually be run uh, one after the other or at least have some overlap. That could impose a six month delay on that design component and could cost in the circuit of six million dollars. So we, uh, our recommendation to you is that if you uh, are thinking of adding between seven and 22 million dollars to this project, it would be much better applied to the construction of the stadium. Uh, that would avoid, that, than to the running a parallel design. That would avoid potential delays it would help manage the uh, risk cost and it would actually p in increase the scope. So our strong advice is uh, not to go ahead with that. Uh, so now in terms of the motion around increased seating to 30,000, uh, and that uh, 
motion in summary is to uh, suggest that B6 Wattpack are actually instructed to develop preliminary design uh, which has a minimum seating uh, capacity of 30,000. Uh, it's also, uh, just so everyone's clear, that uh, increased seating capacity is in the uh, response team option one concept. So that's uh, the concept that does have the U-shaped concourse and it does have a northern stage pocket. So it does avoid those OPEX costs that we were uh, concerned about. Uh, so, and just to be clear, so um, some confusion is um, the, the instructions are about instruction, instructing on minimum requirements of the stadium and uh, maximum budget envelope. So that's what, that's what we would be giving over to B6 Wattpack. There's a lot of uh, work that they would do uh, uh, on that, and, and I'm sure in Q&A time they'll be able to explain that. But um, this is not about, this is exactly what it's going to be. This is the minimum that's going to be in terms of scope and the uh, maximum budget envelope. So there potentially could over time be changes and improvements, but, w but the minimum would be 30,000 seats and a minimum, at a minimum a U-shaped concept. Um, so the estimates, uh, cost estimates that have been done um, for these uh, two, the first one on that first line, and this is all in the report, and um, uh, in any moment I will hand over to B6 Wattpack to talk about this in more detail. RT1 at the top is the one that uh, on the 22nd of July you resolved to move ahead with, uh, and RT130 is the one that the uh, notice of motion is talking to. So that, uh, at that as an estimate, is adding another 50 million to uh, the um, construction price, and uh, th then the rest of the overall budget wouldn't alter, so it would also uh, only be adding 50 million to the bottom line. Um, the uh, as you as you know, and we've said that is based on a three percent escalation, so that has been built in to those costs already a three percent escalation. Um, but just uh, to reiterate, the previous advice we've given to you is that there is a risk of additional exposure <coughs> of uh, potentially could be 6% escalation, and there is the exposure of things that may not have been allowed for and anticipated at this stage. So we're giving some advice around that. Um, what uh, probably um, to note of that is there is not much difference of exposure um, uh, between uh, the 25 seats and the 30 seats, I think it's only at 3.1 million. But we do want to make it really clear that there is that additional exposure. Um, now I, I think uh, it's best to hand over to uh, Greg, this is what Pat, to explain around uh, what the difference between uh, 25 and 30 and also potentially how you reach the prices. Thank you, Mary. <coughs> Looks like I've got no words to talk to there. Um, so the solid, yeah, uh, well, maybe just start yeah, there. Yeah. So RT1 is the budget option. So we were tasked with what can we get for the budget? So 25,000 seat stadium RT1 with a U-shaped conc uh, concourse. 396 was, was in our world, DNC price for the, for the budget number. We were then asked, okay, if we're going to increase capacity and we had more budget, what would it be for 30,000 and what would it be for, there's an in-between, 27,500. So maybe I'll start with 27,500. In our, in our world, and our, our looking at it, to get to 27,500, you can nearly get those in the existing envelope, which is the next slide we'll show. But within the existing envelope, you'll find space with a bit of rationalisation of putting in 2,500 seats. So that's circa 10 million increase to the budget. If we then went to the 30,000 scheme and it is a, a bigger envelope and then we start, you know, obviously more, more structural steel on the roof, uh, the rafts over the bottom, there are some significant costs. Um, and to touch on Mary's point on escalation, in the first scheme, we've got circa 21 million escalation provision in the, in the 396, which is a reasonable provision but with COVID at the moment, 
It's a little bit unclear where that's going. So the QS has got together and said, let's talk about in our world. We'll keep that until we know further down the track what is really happening with escalation. And similarly, when we get to RT130, the escalation provision is circa 24 million. So there's the reasonable provision in our numbers, but with the COVID situation, it was decided to pull that out of that number and we'll reassess it between now and April next year when we've got a better design, a lot of detail, and we're putting a firm price on the table. So maybe we jump to the next slide. So that solid line in the middle is pretty much the footprint of a 25,000 RT1 scheme. And similarly for the 27,500 with rationalisation of the design, which I'm sure Gilbert could talk to if anybody got a question, we could, could fit another 2,500 in that space. So the extra 10 million is build a bit of structure, put some amenities in for 2,500 uh, additional seats. The dotted line on the outside is where the footprint grows for the 30,000 scheme, because we just need a bigger volume, a bigger footprint, and then we start incurring some significant costs. So that's pretty much that slide. And obviously, the field of play, nothing in the centre changes, but certainly the spans on the roof change and the built structure uh, changes. Thanks, Mary. And this is just a summary of dot points of pretty much what I said before. The roof in increases in size for the extra 5,000. Uh, concourse widths changes. Food and beverage goes up. Circulation space goes up. Seismic resilience design is pretty much that roof is a, a pretty is a stiff element and it's got a certain size to, to handle uh, so, to seismic resilience. Uh, that is kind of set. Uh, stair widths increase, amenities increase for the 5,000 and obviously food and beverage increases. So when we jump to the 5,000, it is a significant step up. Um, Gilbert and I are not cross planners, but that is uh, layman's or an engineer's term on, on how, how how that cost got to where Just it got to. Maybe to put it in lay, lay discussion is that to put uh, two and a half thousand, um, you're reducing seat centres, uh, so you're basically cramming more people in, which is acceptable. Um, it is, I guess, less amenity in terms of how close you are to your, to your joining person. There are gaps and spaces that, yes, as efficiency, you wouldn't build structure there, but you could in this scheme to add a few more extra streets, but the dollars per seat increases because of the difficulty of construction um, through there. So, and then also in terms of adding for food and beverage and toilets, um, it's at a number where the incremental increase adds to the existing facility. So you add more pans to an existing building. Uh, you add a few extra metres to an existing food and beverage to cater for those numbers. Once you jump to the next one, yes, then you pass a point of critical mass where you have to build a new food and beverage pod. Yes, you've got to build a new toilet. And so you're not adding a simple small percentage, you're adding a larger increase. So hopefully that sort of explains why it's not a lineal. Uh, once you get to a certain point, it becomes exponential. And uh, that's, uh, do you want, to, this is just a quick picture just to uh, give an indication of size and scale of the stadium. But um, shall we just, we can yeah, that's just a that. snapshot of, of the current architectural model looking to the south, um, and that is of the RT125 scheme. So yeah. it's a significant world-class arena, what we're talking about, whichever way we cut it. Um, you know, that's just, I think Mary pinched that off the, yeah, the screen off the, the other screen. day. Yeah, yes. so. Uh, so actually, I'll just uh, we'll hand over to Leah now to walk through um, in terms of the comparative between... 25,000 and 30,000, the rates and so. Thanks, Mary. Um, so today I'm here to uh, just present the financial impact of the proposed options on the council's LTP that's been adopted. So the first, the two years of the LTP that we are focusing on is FY24 and 25, which is why it's on the screen. And this is because that those are the years that the council funding of 253 million is currently mostly incurred, okay, mostly in 24. On this basis of the two, two options on the table today, RT1, 27,500 seats with an extra cost of 10 million, will have a rates impact mm -hmm of 0 0.02 in the first year and then 0 0.07 in the second. So in total, 0 0.09 impact on our current LTP numbers. The RT1 30,000 seats of $50 million cost 
is 0 0.07 in the first year because that's when we're borrowing the money. The big impact starts hitting the following year when we're starting to pay for that at 0.35 per cent. Okay, so 0.42 over the two. We've also been asked, can we just go down? Yeah. So we were also asked about what our current LTP numbers include for the 253 million currently. So, so you can see in the first row there we have our rates increases over those four year period and the percentage of that rates increase what currently relates to paying for the 253 million that was already in. Okay, so this is, this is an addition to that. I'm going to go to one more down. So I just wanted to also take this time to actually explain a couple of other key things that we need to take into account. So while we've been, um, debt is a key funding uh, tool for councils is it enables capital investment and infrastructure to be paid for by today's ratepayers, but also those in the future. However, while debt is a beneficial tool to promote equity, there needs to be a balance between what we would like and what we can afford. How we manage this balance as a council is to measure and monitor our debt levels in a number of ways. The two specific ways, and the two main ones that we look at, are our debt to, uh, net debt as a percentage of total revenue, and this is also it's an indicator of debt affordability, um, but it is also one of our key covenants with our lender. Currently, as you can see, I've highlighted the three columns that are quite key here. So our current LTP number has in the FY24 to uh, FY25 year of 234. Um, at that stage, we are, our current limit on this ratio is 300 at the moment, but progressively goes down to, to, to FY26, which it goes drops down to 280. So you can see in this scenario, so I've given you two options that gives, shows you the impact of on the ratios if we take either one of these options. Both still within, uh, quite significantly within our, our covenant ratio. The other one that we look at, uh, which is also linked, is our debt headroom. Um, now our debt headroom is limited to how much we can borrow, but we also as a council have a policy to keep a headroom of 400 million. And that, as Krasic will well and truly know, is to take into account when things happen that we're not, we, we don't uh, anticipate, okay? So you can see the impact of this. Uh, this is actual debt. So it's so in the FY26 year when this significantly is the most impact, our current LTP has a headroom of 450 million. That will drop to 412. However, we are still under our headrooms. I was say, I'm not going to talk to that slide. Um, <laughs> um, all right, so look, thank you again for um, having us here today. Um, look, Venues Autotahi have undertaken an analysis of the impact of the additional 5,000 seats uh, in the RT at 30 option. This is in addition to the previous analysis undertaken on the RT1 at 25 option. Uh, this analysis is based on our operating model, the current environment, and reflects high level versus detailed design fundamentals. Our analysis confirms both the at 25 and at 30 capacity options deliver all the core fundamentals, including competitive concert capacity, commercial viability, operational functionality, and a high quality guest experience. Both also with the level one U-shaped concourse deliver an enhanced guest experience and subsequently an increase in spend per head for larger events. Christchurch is New Zealand's second largest city and a proud sporting region. CMUA at 30,000 would make the venue one of the top five largest stadiums in New Zealand. Obviously you are all well versed in, the, uh, in where we sit in comparison, but at 30,000, Forsyth Bar is at 3,700, Mount Smart Stadium, 30,000, Sky Stadium in Wellington, 34.5, and Eden Park, obviously at 50. On this basis, the greater permanent seating capacity that is provided under the at 30 option means the venue is more competitive in the domestic and Australasian markets, particularly for sporting codes such as the All Blacks. Increased capacity at 30,000 also delivers both increased commercial return for the venue, but also greater economic impact for the city, particularly associated with large concerts. 
A bid incentive fund remains fundamental to the success of the CMUA, uh, regardless of capacity. But with increased capacity at 30 and the improved competitive advantage that uh, this delivers, the level of bid incentive funding uh, required is less. Based on our modelling, and again, this is high level modelling, and uh, five years is far away, let alone 25 years, the life of the asset, uh, but this is an estimated reduction of around 30% uh, versus the bid incentive fund required under the reduced capacity of 25. <coughs> From an operating support perspective, the larger capacity at 30 uh, option and subsequent increased opportunity to generate commercial returns, uh, the level of operating support required is also reduced. Look, ultimately, whichever design direction is chosen for the CMUA, it's going to be a stunning, stunning venue. It's one of the last symbols of post-earthquake recovery, and so importantly for our community, uh, will deliver significant social, cultural, and economic benefit for the city. We're excited to be part of it, and we're really, really excited to get on with it. Thank you. Koto, thank you for the opportunity to speak today to support the papers that are already in your uh, briefing pack and to support this notice of motion. Um, Christchurch NZ has prepared technical advice to support an informed discussion and debate uh, with respect to this motion. Um, I'm going to quickly run through some of the constraints and assumptions as we've prepared this advice and then I'm going to hand over to Lauren Heafy who will take you through our findings. Uh, the information that's contained in your papers was prepared by the Christchurch NZ economics team uh, and our economists, and then we also sought peer review from Fresh Info to make sure that we we're using national best practice with respect to economic modelling uh, of uh, both venues and from an event perspective. Our analysis applies to the RT1 uh, concept and RT1 plus 5000 as per the notes in your papers. Uh, we haven't had an opportunity to review full specs uh, for, for the reasons outlined by the team prior, um, and thus our analysis is a like-for-like -like comparison looking purely at the capacity size of 25 and 30. Uh, our, uh, as, as we've noted in our paper, our analysis does not take into account operational spend, which Caroline has just outlined, uh, or any spend associated with the removal of any temporary seating or the reinstallation of that seating, and nor have we taken into account incentive funds in our economic modelling. Um, so Christchurch NZ, in your papers we've uh, estimated both visitor spend and also direct GDP impact. We haven't applied a multiplier for indirect spend and it's important that you view the figures in the paper in that context. Uh, the direct GDP which is in your papers models the values that flow directly into the local economy and we're happy to answer any questions uh, relating to the figures in your papers. We've used a conservative model to uh, calculate the direct GDP impact, and that's in line with national best practice with respect to the productivity and the values that flow from visitor spending. With respect to venue utilisation, we have taken a more optimistic position. Um, we've we've modelled uh, four events per annum, which includes two concerts and two major sporting events such as an All Blacks test match and a Crusaders final. And we're very grateful to have Grant and Colin here today. We hope you can help us deliver on that. <laughs> um, however, naturally, as Caroline indicated, there are a great many variables with respect to event attraction and venue utilisation. Uh, we, we've taken some of those into account in our paper, but we need to always be mindful that we don't know what's ahead of us with respect to some of those um, variables which do impact our ability to attract events. So I'm now going to hand over to Lauren and she'll just quickly take you through the key findings with respect to that economic impact. Kia ora, thank you. Ki te ranga tira, tēnā koutou. Um, as you are aware, Christchurch NZ is the agency tasked with delivering ma major and mega events for Christchurch. And we take a strategic long-term view to bid for and attract major and mega events to the city. We aim to create a balanced portfolio and a future pipeline of, of events which enhance our city's reputation, deliver legacy outcomes and grow our capability as a major events host city. We were asked to review the economic impact of a 25,000 seat stadium versus 30,000 30, seat stadium, but in our report we also reviewed a comparative analysis of other New Zealand stadiums and we looked at the likely number and type of events the CMUA could attract at both 25,000 and 30,000. 
As Joanna noted, there are multiple variables to consider in this economic analysis, which are further exacerbated in a COVID environment. However, I would urge you to focus on visitor spend as the core uh, out come of this paper, which is the number to focus on because it is transactional data that impacts business. So retail, food and beverage spend, accommodation and attractions. As you will have seen in our paper, uh, the following outcomes comparing a like for like 25 and 30,000 seat stadium found that a 25,000 seated capacity stadium with 36,000 in concert mode would drive $13.6 million of visitor spend per year, 37,550 visitors, and they would be staying for 58,950 visitor nights. In a 30,000 seated capacity and a 41,000 capacity concert mode, there would be 16.06 million visitor spend per year, 43,300 visitors, staying for 68,100 visitor nights. We've done a long-term estimation, and while the numbers may seem small, uh, the, and the calculation is based on optimistic use, we believe that actual events secured for the venue may differ depending on COVID outcomes, but also our ability to attract events. The calculation is a like-for-like, like, and it doesn't consider scenarios in which a larger capacity venue is able to attract more events than a lower capacity venue. We also found that a 25,000 PAX event is likely to drive an average of 17.5 visitation, which is the calculation that we used. However, a 30,000 PAX event is likely to attract more like 22.5 to 25% visitation. In layman's terms, a 25,000 seat stadium is likely to be mostly filled with residents, whereas a 30,000 seat stadium allows for more visitors to come, generating higher economic impact. Also of consideration is not just the economic impact of each stadium capacity, but the additional cost to bid for events with a 25,000 seat capacity. A 25,000 seat stadium will require a higher incentive fee, which is likely to be between $400,000 and $1.2 million per piece of event content. If a 30,000 seat stadium can be expected to attract an average of three events numbering over 25,000 people per year, this incentive fund would be a minimum of $1.2 million and a maximum of $3.6 million per year. These additional costs need to be added onto the net difference of economic impact, meaning that a 25,000 seat stadium could cost the city a minimum of 12 million and a maximum of $36 million and additional incentive fees over 10 years. However, there are a number of factors that impact bidding and the value of a stadium to the city, which are not just economic. The net difference between 25,000 and 30,000 is a simplistic view and it does not consider other factors we take into account in securing event, which include a maximum number of VIP suites, a concourse to generate further revenue for food, beverage and merchandise sales, a comfortable seating layout, fit for purpose and flexible broadcast areas and media facilities, flexible and high quality rigging points, and a multi-use focus which allows for both sport and concert mode and the ability to change configurations based on the type of event. There is no middle ground where these aspects should be sacrificed for more seats. They go hand in hand together. Bidding for events is a highly competitive environment and you have watched us as we have worked through this process and not won All Blacks Test Matches or FIFA Women's World Cup 2023. Adding another stadium to the South Island will mean the city must be proactive about bidding for and attracting events. It is not simply a case of building it and they will come. Capacity is not the only decision-making consideration as discussed, but we do have a natural advantage as a metropolitan city. And our comparative analysis shows that the average number of events that can be expected for a city of our size over 25,000 seats would be three to four per year. As Joanna has indicated, these are likely to be one All Blacks test match, hopefully one other major sporting event such as a Crusaders final, and potentially one to two international concerts. 
In addition, it is important to consider the positive city profile and broadcast impacts to the city, driving greater long-term social profile and economic outcomes. Larger sports events typically also drive greater broadcast numbers, meaning a 30,000-seat stadium is likely to allow the city to showcase itself to a larger global audience. Finally, we have undertaken some stakeholder analysis with Christchurch International Airport, who have indicated that the net loss to a city when a large event is on is significant, meaning that we are currently operating in a negative position when it comes to major events. Preventing outbound residents attending events in other cities by being able to host them in our own city is a net economic positive impact. We have also received a formal statement from New Zealand Rugby. This is attributed to Dan Tatham, Head of Rugby Operations. A 25,000 seat covered stadium would likely see the venue as being the fourth ranked venue in terms of ticketing yield for All Blacks fixtures behind Dunedin, Wellington and Auckland. Whereas a 30,000 seat covered stadium would likely see the venue as being the third or second equal highest revenue venue, depending on other considerations. As Christchurch are aware, New Zealand Rugby takes into account a number of different factors when allocating All Blacks fixtures, with the financial return to New Zealand Rugby being one of the core factors. Ultimately, the city will be able to attract and host events in either a 25,000 or 30,000 seat stadium, but we are likely to attract more global event content and reap greater benefits from a larger premium specification multi-use arena. Kia ora koutou. Um, we're uh, just, uh, and we're nearly at the end now, no, it was so, long. Um, so we will um, uh, just touch on the funding options uh, now that were traversed in the motion and just give some information around that. So um, the, in the motion it put forward uh, a series of funding options, one was the sale of Orange Theory Stadium. We do have uh, some information around the value of uh, Orange Theory Stadium but for commercial reasons, we will want to go into PX uh, to discuss that with you. But actually, um, potentially to avoid needing to go into PX, we, uh, Bruce uh, has advised that we could potentially put a fundraising target on around, uh, of around 30 million on that. But if you want the details of that uh, market value, we would need to uh, uh, explore that in PX so we don't actually um, have any commercial disadvantage on that. Um, we, there were two options around external funding, and just to clarify uh, the situation, what's been discussed, one was around Crown funding. It probably is worth noting that the Crown has actually put more money into this project than the Council. So uh, there's the 220 million for the CRAF fund, there's $10 million for land decontamination. There was $59 million into the la purchase of the land, and there was also the funding that they provided for the investment case and pre feasibility case. Uh, so, um, uh, asking them for more money as opposed to council putting more money in itself um, may not, may not, you know, be appropriate given the size of their contribution to date. Um, the, in terms of TA uh, funding from other territorial authorities, uh, the work and early discussions around that, um, just noting that the TAs during the investment case were invited to the workshops and many of them intended the workshop, uh, workshops. The early discussions that were held with uh, people in the mayoral forum at that stage and our advice uh, to council had been that actually it was about OPEX funding from territorial authorities rather than CAPEX funding. So their ongoing OPEX costs, uh, we could be lo looking at something like a regional rate. And we did have some initial conversations with ECAN around how we would go about setting a regional rate to get a annual regional contribution. And the advice um, there was that actually we certainly needed clarity about what level of funding and rating would need to be applied because uh, to set a regional rate 
the ECAM would have to go out for consultation, and in that consultation they would have to advise people the level of the regional rates and, how, and if there was any differential. So um, we were not at the stage at that stage to progress that until we got more certainty around costings and operational impact. But uh, since the resolution on the 22nd, we have uh, made contact with the territorial authorities uh, advising that we would like further discussions with them about that. Um, we are also looking at other funding options and have had some discussions, preliminary discussions, around potential commercialisation options and we'll be working closely with VO around, around options around that. Um, so that's, that's just our advice around other funding and I'll just rattle on quickly um, so you've got time for debate. Uh, so the, in terms of um, advice around whether uh, this decision, if you were to make it today, would actually require consultation or would be considered a significant decision, uh, our advice as staff is that we don't believe it uh, would require consultation and that's for the following reasons and they are traversed in the report. But it's, um, uh, the first one is that uh, this is not a new decision. Council has already made a decision to build a, a multi-use arena and has actually made a decision to invest in that in partnership with the Crown. Uh, their views are, and preferences of the community are widely known and have been uh, considered in previous annual plans and LTPs as you have made those decisions. And uh, you have he heard from a proportion of the community today um, around their views. Uh, so um, the other thing is that the impact on rates in council debt room is not significant, as Leah has said. Um, and... Uh, there's been also the other thing is there has been uh, officer advice before the meeting to allow you can to consider it, consider the decision. So it's not a decision that's landing on you um, out of the blue. So you, uh, so our advice is that we don't believe that it requires um, formal consultation or a special consultative procedure. So just to wrap up, um, our advice again is. Uh, we would like a, a decision um, today and a decision that actually is not re-debated so we can actually move forward and get the stadium built for the city. Um, and, uh, you know, that uh, it is going to be a fantastic stadium. No matter what you decide, it will be a fantastic stadium. It will benefit the city and actually we just need to get on and get it done. So that's, that's our advice. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for all of the detail that you've put into the presentation. Um, there are a few questions, though, and I know colleagues have got questions, um, but I'll, I'll begin. And perhaps, um, I think this is B6 WAPPAC I want to direct this to. So um, when you, I mean, we've, we've focused very much on the number of seats, but when you remove 5,000 seats and you reduce the the, the the outer shell or the superstructure that surrounds the um, the arena. Tell me what else you lose, because it, it can't just be the five thousand seats. I've based my um, response to this date um, on the on the experience of people who go to the venue, recognising that with high definition televisions and live streaming that we're competing with people's you know, sort of lounges and no cues for lose. Um, but, but what else, what, what do we lose from the design brief? You know, you know the, I, I mean, we've already heard about, I mean, one of the presenters talked about the number of lifts, the, um, and I presume that there's the reorientation of the toilets, for example, while I'm on that subject. So can, can you just give us some examples of the other things that we lose? Gilbert's probably better as a detective will go on to answer um, that. <coughs> overall, I think if you look at it and what we try to do is keep as many of the fundamentals as possible. So probably not an answer you want to hear, but it, it, it is really just sheer quantity. Um, it comes down to the fact that once we're trying to reduce uh, a stadium of this size, some immediately does get lost. Uh, seat spacings, uh, proximity to certain amenities, and the like, and the opportunity to sort of somewhat um, provide additional embellishment, uh, for one of a better term, um, and, and the ability to uh, provide um, 
a sort of a more enhanced experience, but it does really come down to the fact that what we've attempted to do in all these schemes is still provide an aesthetically pleasing uh, arena that uh, Christchurch would be proud of, uh, an urban realm that interfaces with the CBD and the, the remaining neighbourhoods, uh, and uh, certainly an aesthetic item that it is not an object just plonked there. Uh, mm. An aesthetic appreciation has to be taken into account, and so we've sort of tried to maintain that. Um, I think most people would just notice the physical size in there and the sheer number of people in that. Um, there is a big difference in 5,000 when you physically see a stadium being emptied mm. out, um, but really it does come down to quantity and a slight experience in the sense of maybe the quality of the seat spacing, the quality of the seats, um, the number of options in terms of food and beverage and the like because you're just reducing the sheer numbers of those elements appropriate to the number of people in the arena. But if you're reducing the number of seats and the scale of the um, activity, is it is it true that, for example, the, the, the toilets end up on the ground level rather than up on the... That, that is something concourse? that, yeah, that's, that was a global decision to make uh, a fundamental saving on all the schemes. Right. Um, we talked about the span of the roof. Um, it's, it's exponential in the sense that Structure engineers design a roof and you go to a certain size of member. That member is applicable for a certain span and can cope with subtle incremental changes. Once you make a large change, that then you know, increases to the next size of structural members all through there. So to make the vast majority of the saving, um, the consideration of moving amenities downstairs would be associated with all the all the options. So that was included in the base case um, no, uh, as well? Uh, there's been a long history about that, uh, what is defined as the base case. Yeah, I'm not I, sure what the value management chain was, you yeah, know, so... You had the base case, which had everything on level one, then I th uh, Mary mentioned about the VM option for the yep. base case, which then part of it was to shrink, which was to put the amenities downstairs. Right. Uh, value so they disappeared earlier. So yeah. in terms of that, and to put uh, context, our previous last statement, uh, stadium that we worked on was North Queensland, where the Cowboys play. Uh, that is exactly the same scenario through there and there. And from a, an experience and feedback from there, there has been no sort of ill comments or anything associated with that particular move. And what's the seat seating capacity of that? 25,000. And it has a roof? No, it doesn't oh. have a roof. It's a drip line for those people who yep. want to know what a drip line is. It's a roof that covers the seats and is a theori theoretical vertical line where raindrops fall, but of course wind has an impact on that. So no, it's um, a traditional football stadium as you might see. It certainly doesn't have a full roof. No. That's one of the significant benefits of uh, this project. That, that's really good. Um, and uh, I, I had a question, I think it's for Christchurch NZ, um, the like for like, because it's not really like for like, is it? Between the 25,000 and the 30,000. Um, so with respect to the like for like, because we didn't have the opportunity to review the full specs, um, we took a position that that would be a variable that would have to build into future economic modelling. Yeah. So our economic modelling at this stage is uh, RT1 plus 5,000. And the airport company was quite explicit in the advice that they gave you in terms of the 30,000. Yeah, correct. In terms of um, the number of additional visitors that we'd be likely to attract on top of the um, local participation within the venue, there was a greater opportunity to uh, attract a larger number of visitors in the larger size venue, which, which stands to reason. And that's because the 25,000 is going to largely cater for our regional pool? That's right, for a local audience, because of the size of the local population and the South Island population, um, we think it's likely we can fill that type of content um, with just the local population. Yeah. So we need the additional capacity for visitors. So the additional capacity is really to attract the visitor spend, which is what people Correct, have which is what the modelling is based on. Yep, that's lovely, thank you. Um, questions, Sarah? Thanks. This one's also for um, Christian Z. Sorry, Joe. <laughs> um, so um, there's, it was quite a good description of that um, net difference and economic impact between the 25 and the 30. Um, <coughs> if you at Christchurch NZ had $50 million to spend outside a stadium project for economic impact, do you think that you could get a greater um, economic impact 
for a different project than that difference, that, that marginal difference. So that's that opportunity cost that Mary talked about earlier. So if we've already got the stadium, we know we're going to get some events, it's going to be awesome at 25. We're, is it better value for money to spend that 50 on a different project that would get a different audience more frequently than just add? If the question wasn't for you. Sorry. Yeah. Is there a question for it? It's a question. Excuse me. Sorry, I was just checking my notes and I didn't notice that there was an intervention that is not required from around the table. Thank you. Question, Sarah. There is always an opportunity of cost, cost with any spending. Um, and we haven't had an opportunity to, to prepare any advice on what other, other things we could spend that money on, but there is always an opportunity cost. Yeah, okay. Um, but are there other projects that have been coming to you that would like funding, that would have economic benefit? I don't feel that I'm in a position to answer no. that question today. I think I would need to bring yeah. some advice back to you, but um, there are always um, uh, projects where money could be spent which would derive an economic benefit, and this is among those. Yeah, thanks. And um, for Mary, um, this, uh, the benefit cost ratios, um, we hear a lot around the table about them being done for evidence and things. Is, is anything like that being done for, for this project? No, so there's been no time uh, to do any cost benefit analysis for this, so the last time it was done was back for in the investment case. At which point it said? At that, at that point, uh, the investment case identified that there was no, uh, the uh, benefits did not outweigh the costs of the additional 5,000 seats. Thanks. Um, Pauline. Thank you. Look, um, just a question. The gentleman who suggested squaring off the um, shape of the arena, I know that you won't be able to give any detail on any savings there, but do you, th do you agree there could be savings realised there and um, would they, could they be considerable and is it viable? Um, the option had been looked at and when you look at it, it, it comes down to the pure notion of tons of steel and when we looked at it currently um, where we sit with the 25,000 it's about on the mark um, there there might be some marginal savings associated with that um, if you went for a four side bar where the scent where the um, corners were cut out which is sort of an undesirable situation um, yes there's a significant saving but once you start filling in and making it more like an arena similar to what is proposed um, there's marginal difference for tonnage. Um, in our world, we look at the supply of steel, the cost of fabrication, um, the tonne of steel, that's the cost, um, and we're looking in the range of values that aren't significantly different. Okay, thank you. I've got Anne, Mike and Tim. Right, and thank you for the, um, all this uh, time and effort and information. Um, a couple of questions. With the, the blueprint you talked about, Mary, the 35,000 that was first mooted with, um, was that a covered arena? When, mm. was, or was it drip line when it was first discussed? It was covered. Yeah. And uh, I, I wasn't around at that stage, and it's never been something I've investigated, right. but my understanding it was covered. At, um, I can assist if, if you like, because I, 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 know, I know the sequence of events intimately. Um, the blueprint was announced in 2012 with 35,000 covered stadium. Uh, the details of who would be building, etc., taking responsibility for the business cases, none of that was included. The original um, uh, design work was supposed to start in 2012. In 2013, the cost-sharing agreement was entered into between the Christchurch City Council and the, um, and the government, the Crown, and at that stage, the government was going to take over the entire project and build it with private sector money. Um, or there would be a commitment to meeting 50-50 the cost between the Council and the Crown, and that was capped at $253 million. If that was not capable of being delivered, then the Crown agreed that there would be an amendment made to the Central City Recovery Plan, the blueprint, to enable the building of a 35,000 seat stadium without a roof, and that that would be the full responsibility of the Council with the Crown providing the land. That's the factual sequence of events. 
Thank you. And another question. Um, we haven't talked a lot about turf health, and I remember when we were first, uh, you know, a lot of the information that we had in terms of the effect of size of the arena on turf health, it would be interesting to hear, um, given the interest in games at the arena, what impact a larger arena will have on that, on the health of the turf. Um, with what you're considering today, between 25 and 30, it'll have no impact at all. Thank you. Um, Mike. Thank you. Um, you've made a very compelling case for 30,000. You know, on the 22nd of July, you also made a very compelling case for 25,000. Um, and you described at that point as it being the sweet spot. Um, so what is the sweet spot? I made, <laughs> I made that decision in terms of the client or region that the stadium arena is being built for. Um, certainly I was asked, we were asked about what we have done in the past and what we represented to other um, regional or how you define yourself. Um, part of that is two things, the actual physical budget and the limitations set by the organisation that is providing the project to us and how we deliver to it. Um, so based on the criteria that were given to us, yes, the, the sweet spot can be determined by what we've delivered elsewhere as being 25,000 people within the criteria that we had been given. And one of the most critical ones is budget. What we're talking about now is that if you are looking to increase it, um, that's another aspect. And one of the other aspects in terms of sweet spot is the aspirational requirements of the region, the city, and how they perceive themselves and place them themselves in the local, national and international stage. Um, and that cannot be judged by dollars. That is a, an emotive argument that has to be sought out by the community. So I guess we've heard quite a bit that you know, 25,000, although we've, we're told obviously that's actually a really good number, you're going to get a world-class stadium. We, we've heard from the public actually we're short-sighted and 30,000 is th that magical number. You know, what is, what is the magical number actually to create a, an arena that's meant to be world-class, fit for the future and attract all the events that we want to see here? I think a comment was made that size doesn't matter uh, at the last meeting and, and I think that is correct. It's the quality of the venue. Um, people stated of arenas in America, basketball, those sort of, they're 15,000 and they're classified as war leading, the experience is fantastic, the atmosphere. So it, it is not about size, it is about the experience, it's about the quality and, and the atmosphere inside there. Okay, excellent. Um, Mary, you had a slide about the maximum budget envelope. It was one of the instructions. Oh, yeah, so this was about the motion. Yeah, that one there. Um, what is the maximum budget envelope? So, so there's there's two different uh, budget components uh, that we talk that we've been talking about. So, one is the maximum construction price, and then the other one. Uh, the, so, that's uh, a component of the overall budget. So, on top of the construction price, there's a lot of other costs around uh, project management governance. There's also some. Uh, early work budget uh, and some of that preliminary work, and they make up the total budget cost. So uh, the maximum uh, price uh, will be whatever is determined today that we issue to the construction uh, to B6 Wattpack. So that will go in the instructions to B6 Wattpack of this is the maximum contract price and this is the, this is the seating capacity. So does that answer the question? I guess when I look at the resolutions, what I'm seeing is no, no maximum price, and um, and so I am concerned there. So in the, uh, um, you'll remember that last time we had that discussion in PX around maximum price, and the resolution was about setting that at maximum price. Uh, today the debate's in the open. So if you add. $50 million into this, it will all go into the DNC. Nothing of it will be spread across the rest of the project breakdown. It will all go into the, cons uh, the construction maximum mm -hmm. price. 
there'll be no, there's, that, that 50 million doesn't contain any other budget apart from into construction. Uh, I've got uh, Tim. Yeah, um, just with regards to the um, picture there with the um, more oval type um, stadium, the design rather than Mr Blackmuir's um, suggestion about a, a rectangle, you know, we, we've made it really clear that it is, we need this and it will be the most outstanding stadium in New Zealand. So one of the key crucial things there is acoustics. So what's the difference between a hard rectangle such as um, and the softer sides? Is that an element there? It's not necessarily a consideration because you can supplement materials and internal treatments and, and, and add things uh, to break up sound, absorb, reflect, uh, depending on the shape. The, de the shape determines the solution, but there is a solution to sort of meet, uh, achieve a similar mm. crop, uh, performance. So that, sorry, it does seem that if you're looking at, say, more modern in towns, but it would be at the, an, at one, the, the, an example, they do seem to be curved rather than, than hard rectangles. I think you'd have to talk to a lot of architects about exactly why they're, why they're curved, but there's no specific requirement. We did Suncorp, yep. and Suncorp is particularly uh, round. Um, Currently, yes, North Queensland. Um, Rabina is another one. Uh, that's completely square, so they okay. don't necessarily have a relationship to, to okay. those. Okay, well, thank you. Jimmy and Aaron. Uh, one question regarding to the Christchurch NZ, particularly regarding to the GDP Christchurch NZ have in here. Thank you. Your presentation uh, mentioned a GDP difference between the 25K and the 30K was $12.5 million. And also, you forecast uh, four uh, events per year, two sports and two concerts. Particularly uh, regarding the two concerts, I'm concerned whether those visitors is more than 36,000 people, the event, am I right? Because 25K. They can provide the capacity up to the 36k thousand people. I'm sorry, I don't fully understand the question. I think we may have answered it in respect to the mayor's question. Um, essentially, the greater the size of the venue, the greater proportion of visitors that we can fit into it. Is, have I understood your question correctly? Yeah, my question is: uh, if you're the, uh, for concert, uh, you know, if your people visitors under the 36k. Actually, 25k knows the capacity can provide those service. Yeah. It's my question. Yeah. Um, What's so, the difference? Yeah. Uh, the way that we're forecasted is that a concert will drive 40% of visitation. Concerts tend to drive more visitors. Yes. Um, we can, at a, in 36,000 capacity, yes. uh, we have looked at that as the number, not 25,000. So when we've done our analysis for sports matches, we've done it at 25,000 and 30,000. Yes. For concerts, we've done it at maximum capacity, so 36,000 and 41,000. Okay. The methodology yes. didn't take into account that Concerts drive about 40% of out-of-town visitors, yes. but sports matches only drive somewhere between 17.5 and, and about 25%. Okay. Does, okay. Does that Thank answer you. it? Thank you. Yeah? Okay. Maybe. Thank you. I've got Aaron, Melanie and Yanni. Yeah. It's just a couple of questions about the, um, the stadium in Townsville. Um, so, well, I paid attention to it because I think it was game two of the State of Origin was there this year. It was a full house. That's um, correct. But they, because uh, of COVID only, uh, have they ever had the Wallabies or the Kangaroos play there? Oh, it's only just uh, recent. Um, in terms of that, no, the State of Origin is the largest. Uh, they've had an Elton John concert. Uh, they've had a boxing match. And prior to uh, the State of Origin, they just had NRL games with the Cowboys. Right, so they get good size events for their age so far, and uh, it's a 25,000 capacity, yet Townsville's 178,000 population, less than half of Christchurch, and the region of North Queensland's 231, which is less than half of Canterbury. So that would suggest that ours should be a little bit bigger? As I, as, uh, as I said, we're, we 
uh, facilitated, construct and design stadiums based on the criteria given by yep. the client. Um, we had certain criteria, and that's what we developed. The determination of size is by the community and uh, those who set the budgets. And on that note, welcome to Canterbury. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Melanie Yani Sarah. Um, sorry, I've got a number of um, questions. Um, the first one is um, kind of related to the acoustics, but more um, the um, outer noise insulation. You know how we went through that process to look at the decibels? So if we're pr making a larger stadium with a bigger roof span, will that change like those predictions or anything like that? Yeah, so I apologise, but no one can hear you I'll be from there. Up and down, so. yeah. Sorry, but the answer to the question is there's no, there's no effect to change to the current district fund changes that apply. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, and this one relates to um, the borrowing that we would probably have to do. So, um, if we were to go to the 30,000. So, um, have we got any thoughts or can they have any, have any reassurance around um, changes to interest on borrowing over the next five to 30 years? Because um, it is predicted that interest rates will increase significantly. Mm -hmm. uh, currently our policy takes into account um, what we predict is going to be the forecast interest rate increases, so that's all taken into account. I mean, it, it is what it is. We can't predict them. I wish I could but uh, we do take that and manage it with our hedging policies as well. Yeah, so there's no possibility we could go over our dear headroom with um, interest costs? No. no. Okay, and um, with following on from what Mike was talking about with the uh, maximum design and contract price, is, is there, I guess what he's really asking for is there a possibility of putting a value into that line to give reassurance to councillors of what they really would be agreeing to? So, so uh, yes, so that would, uh, uh, if you wanted to put a value into it before you voted on it, it would be the f uh, figure that's in the report advice and up there on the screen of 446 million for the so that's the maximum uh, contract price so that's the figure that's in the report and up there that would be uh, the figure that would go in okay there. well I'm flagged sorry I didn't realize that was the question Mike was asking I don't know if no, that's what he was asking no. but that's what sorry. I took from it um, and what I would probably feel comfortable with um, I was wondering, um, we haven't talked really about the 35,000 seats that was the original um, you know, plan under the blueprint, and I wondered if there was any comment on um, a larger capacity arena than what we've been discussing. Uh, yes, so in that uh, report that came to you on the 22nd of July, we actually covered off um, <laughs> options that had been considered and ruled out. So that was options that were below 20,000 and options that were over... Dirty, and I, um, I'll just pull up the advice that was given then, but they were options that were, were ruled out at the time. I think I have got that first report. They were also traversed and considered in the investment case, and they were ruled out at that stage as well. So, um, for just refer back to that um, original report. So, um, so, yes, so it hadn't been, as we advised on the 22nd, it wasn't considered as the investment case has identified that it was not feasible due to the space constraints on the site and the event demand projections undertaken by international events experts uh, who suggested there were very few events of that large, large scale um, and that it was also suggested in the investment case that it would potentially create a poor event experience leaving the arena underutilised for much of the time. Okay, thank you. So I've got a few more. Um, if we were to um, <coughs> um, agree to the um, notice of motion and we were not able to achieve funding through those other mechanisms, how would this be funded? So uh, there it would be, uh, there'd be options. Well, uh, one of them is the rate funding. So that's the advice that uh, Lee has provided today. It would be uh, from adding capex to the budget and rate funding. Uh, 
And um, one question that people are asking, because we've been looking at the um, debt hub room and the debt to revenue ratio, but we have um, not actually really told people the actual value of the, up to their rates as an increase, you know, on a yearly or... We have talked about that, but I don't think that's been in public. Yeah, we released that to the media. So uh, we said that the uh, $50 million extra cost was on average 13 to the average household. Okay. Great. That's all my questions. Thank you. Is that all? Yeah. Sorry. Okay. Uh, Yanni. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you for all the information. I just wanted to check uh, who gets control of the ticket price and is there an option to raise revenue from uh, an additional charge on the ticket to cover the increased costs? Um, so promoters or sporting codes will define the price of the ticket. Um, we do have room to add in inside charges and navigate our way through there. It's not something we've considered in any of the modelling to date. So if we build a bigger capacity for the benefit of promoters or for New Zealand rugby, then we have the ability to get some of that benefit back to cover the co increased costs? Uh, look, I don't think you'd build those costs in uh, for that purpose. I don't think the, the size of the venue is for those codes. I think it's for the city. Um, but again, we haven't really done that modelling, so we can't really comment on how we would build any different types of inside charges than we have already to date. Right, so, but as we go forward with trying to, if we agree to the 30,000, in terms of funding options, can we look at it at the at the at ticket charge to cover the increased cost? And yeah. also, are we able to look at our central city rate as well? Or that's, that's, a, that's a different rate. That, the yeah. rating question is a different question than VO can answer. I think that if you do decide uh, to increase it today, there will be a, 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 we will look at all strategies to uh, meet that gap. So we we'd rule nothing out but we can't comment on those today because we haven't done the cost modelling for them. Right. And, and just so I'm clear, because everything I've read from like the Mural Forum and the South Island um, destination uh, plan that we've developed or we're developing is that the arena is the fourth highest priority. There's been lots of discussions with mayors, chief executives. Is there any formal resolution recording uh, an, either an approach or an agreed... Uh, approach based on OPEX rather than capital? Uh, no. Right. So what's, like in terms of progressing that going forward, obviously Wellington have a regional, a Greater Wellington Stadium Trust. It, is there any ability for us when we do the governance review to look at setting up a trust with our neighbouring councils so that they feel part of the process? I mean, hearing the feedback from the mayors through the media and... and um, it seems pretty clear that they want a greater degree of involvement if they're going to be asked to contribute. So well, can, I, can I just intervene there and just say that neither of the two mayors were on the mayoral forum at the time that Mary came and briefed them on the project? Just saying that, so thank you. So, uh, no, we, we couldn't do that before Thursday, but we could um, look at, we can look at all options, and we have actually, as I said earlier, uh, contacted on the basis of the resolution on the 22nd we've made an initial uh, approach, uh, a letter to the territorial authority and we will carry on and follow up that work. Right, and any conversation with central government about a special legislation that would enable a regional vehicle? Uh, there's some early advice that we got on that and we can certainly bring that back to council around pros and cons of different models uh, around stadiums and special legislation, so we could bring that back uh, at, at a later date other than later right. date today. We'd uh, pull it back out, update it, and we could bring it back. And, and just um, in regards to our projection around incentive bidding for New Zealand rugby, given that it's increased dramatically over the last few short few years, have we got uh, an increase in expected contribution? I mean, I get it in terms of the seat capacity that you can look at what the current incentive bids are, but given what we're seeing with, um, you know, the idea that 
you know, only a few years ago, we weren't having to put significant funding into incentive bids, and we've had to increase it dramatically. Have you calculated a, you know, a level of increase going forward? And if so, what is that calculation? No, we haven't done uh, any modelling particular to, um, I guess, offsetting that increased bid incentive right. fund to the commercial returns. What I would say is the higher quality the venue, the more opportunity you have to uh, generate revenue from ticket sales. So uh, a higher quality experience will increase return custom, uh, will increase the amount you can charge for a seat, potentially, uh, and will increase the amount of revenue you'll generate from the amenity. So things like food and beverage outlets on the concourse, for example. But how, how do we mitigate the risk of like Nelson giving, I don't know, $4 million to get a tier one All Blacks test, meaning that we miss out? I do, you can't really mitigate that. I don't think they would necessarily get the return on that either. Um, but yeah, I mean, you couldn't. That, that's sort of outside the realms of um, okay. competition. And, and from the letter that you read out, so just to be clear, zero commitment from New Zealand Rugby if we go to increase capacity of All Blacks games at the new stadium. <coughs> Look, um, New Zealand Rugby are supportive of Christchurch and have indicated that. Uh, they uh, have an, they're not eager to enter into agreements with any region in the country. Uh, they do have an agreement with Eden Park. Uh, that's their one agreement that they have. But they are keen to bring content back to Christchurch, and, and their statement, reading between the lines, indicated their intent to bring content back to the city. So, yeah. Okay. Um, in the business case that we had done through. Um uh, it, like sort of as developing this, there was talk of synergy with other projects. You, you may recall the initial stadium, uh, the community stadium proposal featured a convention centre and a, a bus interchange a, alongside it with some possible hotels or residential apartments. Um, just looking at the original, some of the comments around the original investment case, there was talk around getting synergy with other projects to offset the costs. Given that we've got this cost um, increase, have you have you considered any sort of additional facilities that would raise revenue on site, such as housing, such as hotels, such as car parking? So, so I'm not sure that that's related to the decision you're making today. Um, but if you want us to explore other options at other stage, we can certainly come back with that. But it's not related to the decision you have to make today. Right. Okay. And just a final question, like so. Recognising that, I think we were told there's a sweet spot if you go over a certain size from like 25 to 30 versus 25 to 27. So it's 10 million to go to 27 and a half, and then to go up to 30, it's 50 million. What what would be the cost going from 30,000 to 35,000? Oh, we don't have. Yeah. We would have if that's a requirement, we can look at that. So it's not that's that as I uh, said in response to Councillor Coker's uh, question, that would not be recommended. That's, it wasn't recommended in the investment case, and we right. certainly wouldn't recommend pausing this project for another two to three weeks while we explore something that hasn't been recommended in an investment case. Yeah, I was just wondering whether because I, what I heard from the designers was that the construction, um, the size of material, is. Um, goes up quite dramatically after you reach a certain point, and that point obviously is over 27,500. So I was trying to understand when the next sort of sweet spot is in terms of having to upgrade the materials. That sort of falls into the realm of doing a parallel design. Um, we would have to, we've done concept design to understand the parameters and then how those parameters are affected by those incremental changes. To, to do that is doing a parallel and would take a certain amount of time wouldn't be able to respond at this point. Okay, thanks. I've got um, Sarah and Jake. Thanks so much. I'm um, probably for Christchurch in said. Um, <laughs> another one, sorry. Um, so the yeah the um, the analyses that have been done are based on you know um, historical trends, current information, those kind of things. Has any assessment been done at all on the um, potential impacts of climate change um, to the viability of this as a, an arena? Uh, no, it hasn't um, with respect to our modelling. Uh, but 
largely the visitation that we're anticipating through the kinds of events that we would attract to the multi-use arena at either capacity will be local visitation, so domestic visitation. Yeah, and um, there is a rising number of sort of international acts, for example, who are looking to cut their carbon footprint and have said that they won't travel till there's alternate options, those kind of things. Has that been taken into account? Uh, no, because it wasn't required for our modelling, but we um, will make the point that there is domestic content that does uh, attract large crowds as well as international content. Yeah, OK, thanks. Okay, um, Jake? Um, following on from, from Yanni's question to a degree, um, those side loader, light, uh, side loader charges you spoke of, could they be used for, say, something like collecting a contribution from ratepayers outside of outside of the Christchurch city boundary? Kind of oh, like time one, but other way around. Ticketing? Yeah. The side loader charges you spoke of. Uh, and side charges. Um, I, like an extra couple bucks if you come from Rolleston or Hung Yorda? I'm not sure it's something we'd consider, but it's certainly something we It's an option look that's at. viable. It's, a, it's, a, it's an option that we could look at. Yeah. Cool, thank you. Any further questions? Uh, Sam? Clarify, just oh. um, picking up on Melanie's question before, I've just, you should never do things from memory. Um, so the difference between the 10 million and the um, 50 million, average household would be over the, after the two years, three dollars for the ten million option increase in rates. For the average household, it will be sixteen for the fifty million. Okay. Um, Sam. Yeah, thank you. And Leah, it probably follows on from that. Can you just confirm though that the model, the financial modelling you've done, doesn't take into account the disposal of land or any other savings? Does it? That's purely if there were no other options. Mm -hmm. Correct. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. Are there any additional questions? All right, look, I'm, I'm yeah, Sarah. Um, just, just actually probably for Leah, is it um, uh, in the same way that we've done sort of heritage and things so that we can be really crystal clear over the, the costs um, over the long term? When we get to the annual plan, are we able to re-jig um, the budget so that we're showing this as a targeted rate, the same way that heritage is, just to be super clear with the costs for people? Oh, well, that will be a decision of council. But it's possible time. to do. But yeah. it's something we can look at. I yes. think that's something we should look at. Yeah. Right. OK, so um, I'd like to take a five-minute break. Um, I don't know about the rest of you, but um, there are pressing needs. <laughs> and, um, I, um, and so if we could just uh, be back here at, um, what is it, uh, 15, 4, 4 15, and um, we, we shall move to debate. And we're going to go, we're going to start sharp at 4.15. Thank you.
Sam McDonald, I'd like to invite you to move the motion. I was going to say, yeah, I'm more than happy to move it. And, I and your seconder is uh, James Gough. Yeah. So it's been moved and seconded. Uh, now, I do understand that um, uh, there is at least one uh, foreshadowed motion, so I'll get that on the table. Yeah, I'd like to foreshadow RT1 at two, um, 27500. Thank you. And um, are there any further... Right, I'll hand... Sorry? I don't have a, a foreshadowed motion, but I'm still concerned that we don't actually, I guess from a governance point of view, have a resolution that um, caps the amount of this um, project. So uh, we've already had advice on this one. So I know we've had like, advice, but it's time. I would, I would just like to, um, I mean, un unless everyone agrees essentially that we we put the the new the new agreed maximum design and construct contract price um, into the into the no, I don't. I don't have agreement to do that. So um, four four six. No. We all know what it is. So anyway, we've, we've had advice on it. It doesn't have to be there. And um, so I will now hand over to uh, Sam to introduce the motion. Yeah, sure. Thank you very much, Leanne. Um, look, I, I think in the interest of time, I won't speak for too long, but simply to say, I, I think you know, it, it's been a pretty bad couple of weeks um, on the whole in terms of this. It's been two weeks of, uh, you know, I guess, uh, real frustration from the community that we potentially get a, didn't get a decision right. Um, you know, it's sort of there's been comments around, um, you know, misinformation or not understanding information or politicising this and that. And I actually think that's all irrelevant now. We, we should, in a, a city like ours, be really proud of the fact that we are a sporting capital, and we should put all that nonsense to the side and say today, actually, let's not even say we got it wrong. Uh, let's go back and say this is the right thing to do. Uh, James Goff and I, along with a few others, obviously opposed it on the day. Um, and at the same time, we've come back with a notice of motion uh, to, I guess, correct that decision. Uh, can I acknowledge Rob as well uh, for his petition? Uh, I haven't met Rob. I don't, I don't know Rob. Um, and I guess I just want to make that point uh, that I don't know him because it is in no way being generated by us. This is a community groundswell uh, from the public. And I think we do need to be uh, cognizant of that. I think if you look back at the chronology of events in terms of when this was first uh, brought to our attention, um, look, absolutely. I mean, uh, middle of June, uh, obviously, Leanne, Andrew and myself were sort of at a high-level brief that there was potentially an issue. Um, in good faith, we, we kept that confidential, because you, you should. Um, we didn't have a figure in terms of what that would look like uh, until well after the LTP was sidelined. Uh, was not sidelined. I'd like to sideline it. Uh, signed, <laughs> signed off. <laughs> and, um, and I think ultimately that really shows that um, the council staff have done exactly the right thing the whole way through. And so I do want to go on record um, because, you know, I think we, or, you know, and I'm happy to say it, I, I've put the staff through the absolute ringer for two weeks, um, but I do need to express confidence in Mary and her team for the work they've done in this, and I think it would be appropriate to do so in this forum. Um, look, I think we've got to a good outcome, and, you know, ultimately uh, what we called for was to put that document into the public domain uh, to ensure that people could see what we see. There's nothing wrong with that. We, we removed the commercially sensitive items. Uh, and actually, the, I think the city's had a really good conversation about it. I think the really good thing about this, though, and I hope you know we don't let ego get in the way of this, it wasn't a wrong decision. Um, you know, There's not egg on people's faces. There's a significant amount of new information. And I think through that public debate for two weeks, uh, actually, we've got to a really good outcome. RT1 uh, at 30,000 is a far better design uh, than what was proposed last year. The concourse is going to add real value uh, to the city and to the, um, to the arena in terms of those long-term financial benefits. So what we're simply saying is scale that up, you know, make it 30, do it once and do it right. So I, I do hope that we take the politics out of this. Uh, certainly from our point of view, this has never been political. This is about the right outcome for our city. And ultimately, I think today we've got to that point. I think th th probably the best thing, and if, if, if we get the, the will of council to support this, I have 100% confidence that the people of Christchurch will back us entirely to deliver this. Uh, the, the groundswell so far uh, has been unreal, and I think, and, and to be fair, quite warranted. And so, you know, I'm probably one that quite often says, in fact, the council don't listen. Um, but ultimately, I think, you know, we should signal today that we've heard what people want, um, and we should get on and build this and do it once and do it right. So I, I do hope councillors really take on board, um, you know, the fact that the community want this. Uh, we promised it, and we should deliver it. So I, I do hope councillors support that. 
Thank you. Anyone else? Um, Aaron. Uh, yeah, well, thank you, Sam and uh, Jamie for or James for doing the work to get us to this point in the last couple of weeks, and uh, and to the staff that have continued on with this, and uh, Mary for your loss of weekends when you had to watch people you're working with go away skiing and stuff. That's hard work. Um, and to the Australians that are here, thank you for spending your money in our ski fields. Um, <laughs> The, uh, today for me is about democracy. Um, the people of Christchurch have got hold of us and said overwhelmingly that uh, they want a larger stadium, they were promised a larger stadium, so on and so forth. The rhetoric sometimes was stronger than that. Um, as a, an elected member, um, I will say to my fellow elected members, if you don't support the 30,000 seat stadium, I'd actually ask you to just not participate in the vote, just abstain rather than vote against what the people of our city are asking for, uh, the businesses are asking for, the people that have put the money in. Um, as an elected member, I'm, I'm more than happy to talk to the government uh, because the, uh, the playing field has changed. COVID has changed things, and uh, so if there's COVID-related costs, talk to a government that's borrowing $100 million a day to bail the country out of various COVID-related issues and just tap that for a half a day. Uh, I'm happy to talk to our neighbours, uh, our fellow councils that haven't contributed yet. Uh, I think of things like we can even introduce zone ticketing where people from outside of Christchurch who haven't contributed uh, are in second in line for tickets when they go on sale because when the Crusaders play their first game in that new building it will be sold out no matter who they play. They could play the Dunsandal 15. Uh, the who will put up a fight for a few minutes. Um, we, uh, the, the concerts that will come through will sell out, so people will want to go to that venue, and the people that have contributed to it should get first dibs on tickets. So you can have zone ticketing. They do it at places like Disneyland. We could take a lead from the best. Um, I think this is about Christchurch. We should become a, a, an entertainment a, a destination for attending sports and attending Adele concerts when we book her for the opening and she does ten nights in a row and then we bring out David Copperfield for his first time to Australasia because he sells the most tickets in the world for anyone that wants to look it up for these amazing events that can come to our city that we've never had before uh, that people will come here and not just spend their money at an event but they'll spend it around a city that's one of the best little cities in the entire world and if we have the smaller stadium some of those sites won't be triggered that empty Hilton building down the road that's been declared waiting to be renovated. It needs a green light like this coming to the city to give a shot in the arm to the other investors that haven't finished spending their money yet in what is the greatest little city in the world. So uh, please vote for it or abstain. Thank you. We've got Anne and James. Jake. So um, best for Christchurch has always been the lens that I've made uh, my decisions through. And on the 22nd of July, uh, the information that we were given, uh, with Gilbert talking about the sweet spot, was uh, led me to make to vote for the decision to have 25,000 fixed seats. This, this, uh, the advice was uh, a response from staff and direction from all councillors to stay within a budget. This was a unanimous decision by councillors following an emergency briefing alerting us to a cost blowout for this project. This was followed by several briefings, during which at no time was there any indication that there was going to be an amendment for a 30,000 uh, fixed seat arena. So the majority of councillors voted against this because we did not have the information to support this case at that time. As a result of this last-minute amendment, staff were tasked with providing new information in order for us to reconsider this decision. This is where we are today. Staff worked over weekends and many nights. Now, I'd like to acknowledge the team, the response team, under the leadership of Mary, uh, and thank, thank them all for the incredible amount of work they've done to bring us what we have, what we have considered here today. So I've been contacted by residents worried about their young children not being able to see the All Blacks because only the lucky few will be able to get seats and that a 25,000 seat uh, arena will be filled. I've also been contacted by residents who are very involved in organising e-games and talk about the exponential growth that is happening in this area. 
I've also been contacted by residents who are happy to pay more rates to have a larger arena. I guess there's a first for everything. I'm also aware, very aware, of the projected growth in our city and our region. We must be a future-focused council, as many have said today. So what's best for Christchurch? Considering all the information provided, I will be voting for a high-spec, multi-use arena with 30,000 fixed seats here that will provide those who attend sports games and other events the best experience in New Zealand. I will be supporting the notice of motion before us today, but actually not number 9.9. The way that this debate has played out has led us down a pathway towards division. Let's change the narrative and forge our way to a united position with the building of this magnificent arena that will be the envy of New Zealand. There is a whakatauki, a Maori proverb, ma pango ma whero ka oti. It means, by red and black, together, it is done. We are proudly red and black. Here in Christchurch in Canterbury, we are famous for standing together uh, to overcome difficult times and to achieve great things. Kia ora, thank you. So let's get together and get this done. Thank you very much. James. Thank you. Just from a, a process perspective, I should probably clarify to the second of notice of motion, which uh, by all intents and purposes is essentially a fail-safe, that if you wanted to vote against the first one, that we'd just implore you to at least have an apples with apples comparison of preliminary designs. Now, quite honestly, though, my preference is to put that money directly into the RT at 30 option. Um, but that being said, it, cost is actually quite a funny thing, really, because it, it only is given meaning when you overlay it with value. And I think the value proposition was there when we originally considered this matter a couple of weeks ago. Um, but now with the new information that we have, I don't think that it's just compelling information. I think it's irrefutable. The, uh, the, the cost estimates that have been revised and significantly reduced and the detailed economic analysis of the positive impact that, that additional 5,000 seat capacity arena will mean for the local economy. And that's the reason why we're doing this. The additional 5,000 seats is a significant number. It's the total capacity of Tapai, the convention centre. It's actually also the same figure of the total number of people who come annually to Christchurch as a result of the Antarctic programme. Another, uh, uh, quite a sad statistic that we've got, and it's been alluded to today, is that the busiest days that our international airport has ever had in its history, in terms of passenger numbers, is when there have been events on in the stadiums of Auckland and Eden and Wellington. So those record numbers are Christchurch residents being exported to other regions as a result of our inadequate facilities. I do think it is worth noting, though, too, that a 30,000-seat stadium or multi-use arena is not a mega-sized venue. So we're not talking about uh, you know, uh, a high, high volume, low yield or trade-offs like that. This is still a boutique um, multi-purpose arena that will provide an unparalleled user experience. But 30,000 is not a large number. Um, but I do think it is time to stand up and be taken seriously again, to miss out no longer. We owe it to our residents. We owe it to the people who have put their money where their mouth is and invested in the city. You know, we're not going to get another chance to do this. Don't cut elements that generate revenue and significantly elevate our competitive advantage and the ability to attract greater content. So the deafening call from the community needs to be heard by the council. Please back our city. Please back our future. Be on the right side of history here and make the right decision to build a 30,000 seat capacity multi-use arena today. Thank you. Okay. Okay. I'm, um, yeah, I'm, I'm happy to support a 30,000 seat stadium um, today as, as one of the, the changed votes. There, there's a couple of reasons for it, but there's only one that's been really key to my decision. Um, public support, the economic benefit and, and the reduced costs have all been have all weighed in, in terms of my, my changed vote. But the thing for me that's really brought me across the line is understanding that actually when you take all those things in combination, the rates impact is actually a lot more modest than what was first than what we first thought. We're looking at $16 a year, but but at worst case, I think that's really important to stress. At worst case, um, so I want to reassure the residents that have contacted me saying, you know, don't listen, stay staunch. We don't want our rates to go up at all. 
that um, that this is at worst case a sixteen dollar a year increase. But I'm actually entirely confident that that the options that we're looking at in terms of orange theory, the options that we're looking at in terms of um, uh, a very persuasive mayor talking to WiMac and and Salwin and to, to net some extra net, net some extra contributions, be that capital or or opex. Will, um, will actually result in a much lower bill for, for the ratepayer of Christchurch. I think this is a rare example where we can actually have our cake and eat it too. Thank you, Phil. Yep. Okay, Doug. This arena is probably the most important building post-earthquake that the city has or even will ever embark on. It is an arena which will serve all of the South Island from Omaru up. The new report by Christchurch NZ clearly showed the economic benefits to the city of comparing 20, 25 to 30,000 seats. It's in a way, sometimes I think it's a pity we didn't see it a wee bit earlier. But as I previously said, I take my hat off to all the businesses in the city who have taken a financial risk and have put their necks on the line to build their business after the earthquakes. Some in particular have made their decision to commit to the city based on a stadium of 30,000 seats. The government. This government and the previous one realised the importance of this project and gave us both land and money to get this project off the ground, and I thank them for that. The total cost to council at this stage will be the original 253 mil plus maybe the 50 mil that we're talking about for the extra seats. This brings our number to 303 mil for our, for our portion, for an arena which could well be worth over 600 mil when it's complete. This asset will be, by a long shot, the best arena in the country and it will be in our city, Christchurch. As we have heard, the flow on effects will be enormous, i.e. hotels, bars, accommodation, taxis, restaurants, airports, to name a few. When the extra cost came in at 131, I was like everyone went, whoa, this is not good. But this was value managed down to 88. This figure then went down to 67. This is when some fellow councillors and myself called for this notice of motion, and here we are today at 50 mil. Now, some say that this has been a political stunt. I can assure you, all here today, it is certainly not. The notice of motion was done because it was common sense, and for the city of Christchurch and the South Island. Please do not lose sight of the value of the old stadium in Addington. There is five hectares of surplus land there, worth and there's a number there in the lab, so, um, <laughs> which can be used to offset the 50 mil. But the real benefit for that land, it could be used for housing, which is desperately needed in that area. Whether the council sells it outright or partners with a group of builders to get a better return, anything is possible. Even if it was a standard subdivision, there is 100 sections there, and for a, which, for a start, gives us 3 million bucks in development contributions anyway. Um, I believe this is certainly a decision worth taking, and um, we only have one shot at this, so do it once, do it right. Thank you. Tim. Tim. Um, thank you. Today I'll be supporting the 30,000. I think a high quality venue with 30,000 people is the right thing to do. If you think way back, the Beatles played their first. Um, um, gig in America at Yankee Stadium and they had their sound going through their tannoy system and that was acceptable then. It is not now. I can go and um, a few hundred dollars I can get Amazon Prime, Netflix, Disney Prime, um, Sky Sport, then go home and watch it on my 75 inch TV, 4K Ultra HD smart TV for less than $2,000. So the live experience is absolutely essential. When a lot of the, uh, uh, the other stadia and arenas in New Zealand were, were finished, eSports wasn't even thought about. eSports can fill a stadium, but the real key there and the real value for um, Christchurch will be the 20 million people globally watching the eSports games. That is worth a fortune to us as a promotional video for Christchurch. But they will only go to high quality venues. We are absolutely on the crust, which we can really, really do with. And I'm, I really support this 30,000, and I hope you will too. Um, Andrew and Pauline. Thank you. Um, we were asked to make our original decision in the absence of the latest facts. 
and with no notice before the meeting three weeks ago that there would be a suggestion of an over-budget option, understandably, the work that was been done was concentrated on on-budget model. Now, there is new information in front of us today, a new additional um, budget increase that is almost 50% less than the 88 million that we were faced with um, three weeks ago, and more importantly, or just as importantly, new economic impact projections and some commentary from within the industry. Uncertainty and controversy will impact on the cost, on public confidence, and on the ability to raise any external funding. And in fact, I think it's fair to say they already are. In the past three weeks, we've seen controversy and some of that impact and some of the associated cost actually start to play out. I want that to stop, and I want that to stop today. Community uprising and community passion are both amazing things, and maybe something we don't see enough of in this city. And I, for one, have been listening to all of the opinions that have been expressed to me over the past three weeks, and there have been a variety of them. But I don't want to do anything that unnecessarily increases costs. I want the capital budget for this project to be spent on the build. I don't want to do anything that causes delay, because we've waited way too long for this facility already. 50 million is a huge investment in anyone's language. The financial impact of the additional over 29 years is a far lesser rate impact than we originally expected, and we remain well within ratios. But the default position is that this will impact on rates, and it still surprises me that those that have previously advocated a zero rates increase um, were three weeks ago advocating that we put the 88 million on budget. is less than that now. That makes it a different proposition. But the last comment I'll make is a comment about what leadership looks like. It's the ability to be brave enough when presented with a new set of facts or a new set of unacceptable risks to make a new decision and, in fact, to encourage others to do so. It's to put what's best for the city first, to have the guts to climb down from a previous position that was taken based on different information and to have the confidence to make a different decision, a decision that creates certainty, that shows leadership by moving to a position that's capable of being agreed, not only around this table by councillors, but by council together with the community, so that we're able to capture the economic and the social benefit and the huge opportunity that sits right in front of us today. So it's for those reasons, and because of the new and significantly different information, that I'll today be supporting a Canterbury multi-use arena with 30,000 seats. Thank you. Pauline. Well said, Andrew. Yeah, look, this is the last of the anchor projects. And isn't it great to see how it's energising our city already? So imagine what it's going to be like when it's actually physically there in all its state-of-the-art glory. And look, it's already been said how the information we had a couple of weeks ago was based on a budget. Uh, and the options were accordingly tailored to fit in within that envelope. So today's notice of motion, in my view, is effectively asking us to increase that budget by 50 million to achieve the 30,000 seats together with the concourse, the closed roof, the in situ turf, and all the other components necessary to create the world-class facility that we're expecting. Look, I'd normally prefer to go out to, uh, to consultation for that amount, but we've been given advice that it doesn't trigger the significance policy. And because it's super important to me that we get on with this, and I think I'm speaking for everyone around the table here, no further delay, especially at a cost of $1.2 million a month, but more so now to keep up the momentum and the, the energy and the, the buzz that we're getting about the stadium. So for me, delay is not an option. I want to get on with building this multi-use arena. It will be the best possibly in the world. Um, I must say, though, I am wary of the costs involved and the potential escalation, but I realise that things will come back to us in stages for confirmation and approval. And in that, in that area, the 25,000 uh, option, seat option was a safer bet in my regard. However, as I said, we are going to get a state-of-the-art multi-use arena, so, so supporting this no notice of motion will actually achieve that. Um, and that is what I will do for the regeneration of Christchurch City today. We're still in the early days of preliminary design. We've got a long way to go. We can't afford any more delay. Um, look, thanks everyone who's come in today to engage with us. 
um, and for getting in behind this project. And also, Rob, thank you, wherever you are, whoever you are, <laughs> for um, putting that energy into gaining the 24,000 signatures in such a short time, time frame. That was a massive achievement. Uh, it's awesome to see Christchurch displaying this amount of passion. So I will support the notice of motion today, but I will ask the Mayor to put um, number nine separately as well. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Sarah. Kia ora koutou. Um, the sixth IPCC report released on Monday made it clear that our world and our city is going to be a very different place with very different concerns in just a couple of decades. Drought, floods and coastal inundation are on their way and we need the resilience and the capacity to deal with them, not to mention the Alpine Fault. There has been no assessment of the impacts on climate change on this project and adding barely used seats to the arena is definitely not future-proofing the city for the challenges that we are facing. Good on those who got the petition and survey together um, and put the pressure on. It's clearly worked, but there is an opportunity cost which I'm unable to support. For $50 million, wherever it comes from, we will get 5,000 plastic seats, but we could have 5 million trees planted across the city and peninsula free buses for under 25s and vulnerable groups, or stop banks in coastal or river areas affected by flooding. We could even bring back the free Central City Shuttle instead. But the reality is ratepayers' pockets are not bottomless and we can't spend the same money twice. For $50 million, we could buy, w build warm, dry homes for 100 struggling families. When the Living Earth composting plant needs future proofing with further upgrades or even moving site, we'll be told there's no money. When Akaroa needs future-proofed water supply to avoid the impacts of climate-driven drought, sorry. It also beggars belief that councillors are asking for central government funding for rugby seats and not for parts of our hospital that clinicians call clinically unacceptable. Where's the petition for additional hospital beds or decent renovations to stop residents being treated in third world wards? Spend the money on things that really matter for all our residents. And when the, will the next report be, asking for additional money, millions as costs blow out? What opportunities will we lose then? My prediction all up, it'll be over $700 million. Thank you to all of those who've been in contact with me, encouraging me to stay true to my values and to look to our climate resilience as a city. I am, and I have no doubt that that will make the next few days um, interesting. I want to finish the rebuild of our city with a brand spanking new arena for gigs. But we have heard clearly that 25,000 was and is an international quality arena that will bring huge benefit to the city. I'd have compromised with 27,500, downsizing infrequently used seats for extra capacity. But $50 million for maybe four events a year is simply not justified when there's so much more at stake for the future of our city. Um, <laughs> Melanie. <clears throat> so, um, <clears throat> following um, from Anne's debate, I'm firmly red and black. Since the last meeting on the 22nd of July, we've heard from an array of voices. I've heard from and understood um, from those who are still not keen for Christchurch to have an arena or would prefer to see it at Lancaster Park. There are still people that think that. I've also heard, I'm just stating all the voices that I've heard over the last few days, a huge number of people, including those who have signed the petition, have made it clear that they would like to see a 30,000 seat arena to increase the likelihood of tier one all black games and international concerts coming to our city. These people don't want um, council to be short sighted and include people like my father who lives in Selwyn, who's been texting me this morning to read the letters to the editor um, to inform my view today. But, yeah, well, um, but today, not surprisingly, I also um, want to be a voice for the even greater number of people who've actually spoken to me or contacted me online, but especially in person, is, um, expressing um, concerns over um, concerns um, over going the, over the initial budget. Um, so even this morning, um, about eight o'clock this morning, I received an email. Um, with the following, which sums up the sentiment of most of them. Just a quick email to say our fan out in sprayed and supports Council's earlier decision to build the stadium at 25,000 seats. Let's spend our money wisely on aspects that will make the greatest impact on our communities and their well-being. 
Um, and from a young person I heard from, um, he said, I'd love to see Christchurch with an impressive stadium, but I can't see the cost for the extra seats being worth it. I'd much rather we prioritise more important issues in a stadium. And then from another resident, um, there are so many other things that could be done with 50 million, especially given the ecological crisis we face. Others have been concerned about the unexpected future cost. Steel alone has gone up by 20%, she said, on six months. What does that look like over the time of the build? I have to say, I initially expected that our residents would be pleased that the council would be fiscally responsible, and I quote, live within our means and lead by example. However, on balance, it seems that the voices we've heard here today especially are not concerned about the financial implications, are concerned about um, the future of the city and what this will mean. So um, I am concerned myself that we may be writing a blank cheque to increase the seat number to 30,000, but who am I to deny them? And like I said last time, bring on Michael Bublé. <laughs> <laughs> Um, Jimmy. Before today, I received uh, some of the you know, residents asked me to vote for the 25K. Some of the people asked me to uh, vote for the 30K. So no matter, you know, I voted for the 25K or 30K. So part of people were, you know, very happy, but part of people will be the disappointed. However, the principle of decision making is based on the, the information that we receive. So the councillors may we receive information on 22nd July. Now, actually, in that time, there is the extra or additional the, the cost for $88 million. So up to the last Friday, you know, we are aware or this uh, uh, review then is uh, uh, can uh, actual for the uh, fifteen uh, uh, million dollars and also the, uh, the we received uh, today you know the eight different uh, group and also received uh, those uh, twenty four thousand one hundred uh, signature is a diverse one all support a uh, uh, thirty thirty k the seats so it looks like a majority of the city the community, this group, and the people probably in favor more is a 30K rather than the, uh, the uh, 25K. And also, the, uh, I agree, you know, the, uh, the deputations that today particularly mention we build uh, this uh, facility because this is the last uh, the kind of anchor project of the earthquake. Uh, recovery because one of the senior council I passed through all the the process of the earthquake the the the, the, the stages you know, from the, all the recovery from now the set up the welfare center for the repair and the recovery today is the regeneration you know. so this project is the I think it's all of our people in Christchurch, even in the Canterbury region, you know, to focus on this one. It's very, 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 very seriously. And also today we make this station. It's not a uh, decision. It's not a for today, for this generation, for next generation, next next uh, generation. I ask the uh, Councillor James Go. I ask him that when the the the, the and. Uh, Lancaster, the, the kind of stadium was built. He told me that it's built by the 1881. So more than 100, 1881? 1626. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 1881. Yeah, yeah, so we build it's not for today's you know, this stadium. We build it for the future stadium. So future we can see that even the, the now have a greater quiet church, the, 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 uh, the join the committee or mass forum, we focus on the, after the 2051, so this city probably, and this region, probably increase up to the 700K. Thank 700K. you. 700K. Thank you. Okay, That's so the, I support, today I support the 30K. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Catherine. Oh, well, thank you. Um, I won't take too long because I think all the fantastic points about supporting this dose of motion have always already been raised, and I realise the time I'm sure everyone would be wanting to go for a beer right now, and hopefully a celebratory one. 
Um, look, we really get the opportunity to be able to revisit um, a decision that's already been made. Um, it's a really unique opportunity to be able to revisit all the new information, a really unique opportunity for us to make the right decision the first time, um, get it done once, get it done right. Um, so I really urge our fellow councillors not to abstain on the notice of the motion, not to um, vote against the notice of the motion, but actually to vote for it um, and vote for the future of Christchurch. Thank you. Um, Yanni? Yeah, thank you. Um, I certainly appreciate the comments and the views that we've received. Uh, I think one of the things that has been illustrated is that, sadly, when this project was put in the blueprint, there has been no public conversation about the size, the cost and the location, and that has been a fundamental mistake. Uh, we can't change that. I appreciate that there are cost pressures around delay, but it seems to me, thinking about what people have told us over the last two weeks, that people feel an emotional connection to the size of the stadium. And what's become apparent to me is that we do need to take a longer term view than just the here and now. And to me, that view needs to be that we need a stadium the size of 35,000, not 30K. Because once we put the roof on it, then it'll be very hard to extend it even further. I think that's been very clear from the designers. The reality is that COVID has completely changed our world and it has caused cost pressures to accelerate in terms of the construction of the stadium. But I think what's tragic about this is that Lancaster Park is actually the optimal space for it to be. Lancaster Park is as close as Forsyth Bar is to the CBD and the benefits that so many people have talked about today would equally be shared if the stadium was built back at Lancaster Park. Not only would we get a win-win, we would actually get a community that values having a stadium uh, within it. We would have less complaints about noise, traffic, and it would not limit the events in the way that I fear that the central city location will. I think the other benefit that we would have as a council that wants to get people living in the central city and in the inner city is that we could use the value of the land that has been acquired to develop housing on the designated site to get greater vibrancy and custom for the central city businesses. So it's a win-win. And of course the money that is earned from that could be put back into offsetting the cost of the stadium. So in my view, what we should be doing, and I was told that all options were on the table, is we should be building a 35,000 covered uh, arena at Lancaster Park. This keeps costs to, uh, it saves the money, saves the money that we've spent. We've still got $30 million being planned to spend around traffic uh, with the new site. It also, I think, works really well. For those of us that were here before the earthquake, we saw that Lancaster Park hosted a Bledisloe Cup game and people walked from the central city along High Street and Ferry Road. It was really successful, it worked really well, and it delivered great benefits for the hospitality industry within the central city. So um, that's my view, uh, but I have to say, as someone who didn't vote for the 25,000, I will support revoking the resolution that we have uh, in front of us today. I don't agree that was the right decision. Thank you. Is there anyone else who wants to before I hand back? Oh, Mike. Thank you. Um, just quickly, look, I don't disagree with Yanni. Actually, my preference would have been to rebuild on Lancaster Park, but I think the decision, um, you know, many, many years ago, sort of makes that redundant now. Um, I will be supporting the, the notice of motion, um, but with a cautionary note, I, it does concern me the refusal um, to actually add what our new funding limit would be to our resolutions to make it very clear. Um, I, I just feel that the way this is going to head, we'll be back here in May with, with a significant increase of, of the 50 million we talk about today, and we will we'll be looking at a stadium well north of 600 million, um, which, is, which is going to be a shame because you know, there are missed opportunities when we, we sink a lot of money into, into a stadium. And um, we have been told very clearly, uh, whether it's 25,000 or 30,000, it will be a world-class arena that will attract tier one All Black Games, because we have to pay for the All Black Games no matter the size of the stadium. It will attract world-class concerts. Um, so it is a shame for you know, that we had to come to this. But look, we have had a lot of feedback from, from the public and actually I've received a lot of emails um, to, to not actually revoke council's decisions. So although that's been very 
um, the support to do this, this um, notice of motion has been quite vocal and loud. There has been a lot of actual support behind the scenes to actually the original council decision um, back on the 22nd of July. Um, and it was interesting at, at, at the time, and like rightfully so, councillors can um, bring amendments to, to the floor. Um, um, but yeah, I guess in, on hindsight, it would have been good to have a little bit more time to get that information in front of us. But from the information that I received on the day, it, it was clear to me that we were actually making the right decision. You know, to be told, even knowing that there was discussion around a 30,000-seated uh, arena, that actually the 25,000 was the, the sweet spot, was kind of sealed where I was, was heading. Um, and then to listen today to very compelling reasons um, why actually a 30,000 seated arena is the right way to go um, is kind of disappointing um, for us in a governance uh, position making massive decisions for the future of our, our city. Um, look, I, I think no matter what uh, decision we ended up, we would have ended up with actually a world class arena. I, I am concerned about some of the missed opportunities that we're going to get. I'm concerned about where that this contract price, this bill price is going to land and actually what that does do. Uh, we do know our debt headroom is pretty close to the, to the limit and what's that, how's that going to impact? So I'll support this today, but I am very concerned where this is heading. Thank you. So I think before I hand back to Sam, I think I'm the last one mm -hmm. um, on the blocks. The blueprint was designed to give confidence to investors and developers that the city had a future after the earthquakes. I'm on the record as saying that the true heroes of our central city rebuild are the investors and the developers. The, the government and the council were going to lead the way, but uh, they didn't wait. It is unfortunate that the 2012 blueprint raised an expectation that we could build a 35,000 seat covered stadium with no money on the council's budget to help pay for it. And it didn't help that the details of the cost sharing agreement were kept secret until well after the 2013 council election. We inherited a $400 million hole in our budget and we negotiated a global insurance settlement well below the assumptions we inherited as well. It's actually really hard to negotiate a settlement when the government's already told the uh, uh, reinsurers that we are building a brand new stadium somewhere else. But as a city, we re really could not pay our share of the cost sharing bill without divesting ourselves of revenue generating assets. That's what Treasury wanted the previous council to do. Um, and the council at that time ruled that out and told us we could have it all. Um, unfortunately, that has meant that we've had to revisit things and we have debt-funded obligations that have arisen from that time. And that's why there was a delay in the, in the budgeting of the financing for this um, project. The focus on the budget, though, as we've heard, has dogged the process from start to finish. And we now need to make a decision to increase the budget. And that's what we're doing today. Um, I um, don't actually want to support uh, the request to central government for more money. They have been extraordinarily generous, and I think that we should end this now. And you know, I was disappointed to hear the Minister of Finance having to justify what has been an extraordinary contribution from central government. We advised our neighbours in the region in 2016 that we would be back to discuss a regional rate for OPEX, not for capital. It's OPEX that hits our rates, and that's where I want them to make the biggest contribution, but I will do what I am told by the council. I'll accept the offer from councillors on um, working together collaboratively on external funding without any politics, and uh, while meeting our wider uh, commitment to risk and resilience, including climate resilience. I think building for the future means accepting the intergenerational responsibility that comes with that, and we need to hold true to those values when we make this decision as well. Sam. Um, yeah, thanks. I've really enjoyed the debate. I think it's been really mature and professional and uh, has verified that uh, you've proved me completely wrong. Uh, the council does, in fact, listen to the people of Christchurch. So, uh, I'm really pleased with the level of, of that debate. I think in the interests of getting this thing built, I won't speak any longer. We should just put it to a vote. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, right. Well, I'm going to put um, some of these uh, separately, so I'm going to block them, group them all. Um, Yani, you wanted to have the revocation um, resolution put separately. Because it requires a different quantum of votes as well. Sorry? Doesn't it require a different quantum of votes? No. 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 Well, separately, if you can. Yeah. I mean, the, the wording is that the council revokes its 22 July resolution and replaces it with the following. But I, I'm happy to put that the council revokes its 22 July 2021 20, resolution um, and, and leave it at that. So are you happy for that one? So I'll put that the council revokes its 22 July 2021 resolution. All those in favour say aye. aye. Those opposed say no. Um, and yes, yeah, so that's that's Sarah. So um, and now we move down the page. Uh, well, was <laughs> <laughs> that just Sarah or Yanni? Well? No. Just Sarah. I didn't hear, I didn't hear Yanni. Yanni didn't vote no on that, did he? No, no. he wants it to support it, but he's going to vote no on other things. All right, can we scroll, please? Can we keep, keep, going? keep going? Right, stop there. So um, I'm going to put uh, number six, request staff to work with central government for additional funding because of COVID-19 inflationary pressures. So I will put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. 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 <laughs> oh, put dear. your hands up for no's on six. One, two, three, four. Five, six. Mike, Jimmy, Melanie, One, two, Sarah. three, four, five, six against. Right. Thank you. That's carried. I mean, that's, yeah, that's carried. Uh, and the next one is, um, oh, I won't put number eight separately. Request staff to review the council's capital programme and identify savings from existing budgets to inform the draft 2022-23 annual plan. I put that motion. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. No. That's pretty even to me, so we'll take a division. So for resolution nine, can, and can you put your microphones on when you um, do your call? We we're talking at nine. Councillor Templeton? At uh, no. Councillor McLennan? At uh, no. Councillor MacDonald? Yes. Councillor Johansson? Yes. Councillor Galloway? No. Councillor Coker? No. Councillor Chen? No. Mayor? Councillor Scandrett? Yes. Councillor Major? Yeah. Councillor Keown? Yes. Councillor Goff? Yes. Councillor Davidson? No. Councillor Cotter? No. Councillor Chu? Yes. And Deputy Mayor? No. <coughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, yes. And one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine for no. Thank you. It's lost. Um, I will uh, put the whole motion. Sorry, can I just ask that you put one separate as well? Sorry? Can I just ask that you put one separate. I did. What, which no, one? The resolution one. The one A. Oh, resolution BC. one. Okay. I'll put um, resolution one. Uh, all those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Yanni Johansson, Sarah Templeton. Um, and I'll now put the total motion as amended. I'll put that. All those in favour say aye. Aye. Those opposed say no. That's carried. Sarah Templeton. That's carried. So thank you very much um, for everyone. I just want to agree with... Uh, what Sam said, and that is, is that I think that the quality of the discussion and the debate was extremely good, and uh, I want to thank everyone who has 
contributed such a vast amount of work uh, to turn around what is a significant decision in a um, relatively short period of time. So I just wanted to acknowledge you all and again to acknowledge um, the members of the public who have come in uh, to support uh, our council decision making today. Thank you very much. Um, now going to, because of the um, time that we are at, adjourn the meeting now to uh, Tuesday the 17th of August uh, at 9.30am. So the meeting now stands adjourned. Thank you.